Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Logan Hicks and he's an uh, expert on self-healing cyber weapons. Mm. And um, Logan, go for it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you for coming to the talk. Welcome to B-Sides Tampa. Um, I hope you enjoy and get what you're looking for. Uh, just a quick disclaimer. I'm not involved in any of your projects. And uh, if you happen to make something from completely not acquired source code from me, that's on you, bro. <laughs> Absolutely. Not getting that jail time. No way. Um, but yeah, so this topic is going to be on self-healing cyber weapons. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's initially a broad topic to bring you all up the same level of understanding and then very, very quickly drops into very technical details. So it's going to be very rapid in terms of that. So there are three or four sections for questions that will allow at each different phase to help you shift into the next topic and get any general questions you may have or advanced questions. Extremely long questions, please hold those to the end. I'm going to be here for the rest of the day. and I'm sober now, so we should be good. Um, all right, so a bit about me. My name is Logan Hicks. My handle is Falinor. I have three other ones. Good luck finding them. Um, I've made a lot of really cool toys, tinkering objects, and uh, a couple of other interesting things in life. Uh, I'm really well known for Venator. It's an automated sock analysis tool that actually does everything for you, goes out, collects the artifacts, images, pictures, documentation, annotation, everything. It's all in one PowerShell, 3,000 lines published. I built a UI for it, and eventually I'll get buttons on button that on click to work. I'm not a professional developer, and that's taking forever. Um, I'm fun employed, left my recent position uh, with some issues. I just didn't like those people anymore, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, I've got a lot of interesting hobbies. I like to brew, I like to do a lot of charity work. Um, I'm really heavily interested in video games. Hardcore gamer, been so for a long time. So I like that. It's fun, it kills time, and it keeps my mind busy when I'm trying to take a quick 10, 15 minute breathe that ends up into a two hour league match. So. It happens, and uh, I build really crazy shit for fun, and sometimes my projects take me a little far, like self-healing cyber weapons. And so we're going to go ahead and jump into that uh, in a short minute, and on, back, on me, my background is very heavy in DOD and military, and so obviously I've played with a lot of cool toys, and because of that, I built a lot of my own. So, jumping straight into the talk. One of the first things, when I started looking at building this talk, the first things I asked myself is, why am I making my talk this morning? <laughs> I pushed and pushed and pushed and delayed and deferred, and it really burns you pretty quickly. Next thing you hit me with was, how many drinks did I have last night? Because I was having issues staring at my screen. Um, it was a very fun night. And uh, the next thing that I was starting to look at when I was starting to clear up because of Excedrin was how far can I push this talk without going to jail? And that's because of current industry standards. You really have to be careful because you can very quickly go from concept code to jail time. Can I ask real quick, what, what, what adapter you it. have? A mini. HDMI mini, it's fine. I can use my mini. Yeah. Oh look, I got this. HDMI mini, I may not um, <laughs> So the other thing is, is with cyber weapons, when you start to look at building cyber weapons, you're no longer looking at a solution from a defender's perspective. You're looking at taking an instance, an object, a process, or a service, and weaponizing. So you're no longer using it for defensive purposes, you're using it for aggressive purposes. So you're taking something like a seam solution, which is my first cyber weapon, and I took it and made it an offensive capability. So it wasn't just a seam solution anymore, it was now hacking people back which was a very interesting process with security analytics, which was my first Tinker toy when I was at RSA. Um, and the last piece for us, which is a huge concern constantly in the cybersecurity industry, especially for researchers, what are we going to do about current regulations? Uh, for us, I'm in Georgia, uh, just moved to Georgia, and Georgia's passing a new regulation that's effectively the CFAA all over again. And they're making it to where they're pretty much borderline outlawing pen testing and research related pen testing, which pretty much forces us to leave the state and kicks out our cyber and Fort Gordon at the same time. So, obviously, they didn't think that one through before they pushed to the Senate. So, that's going to be interesting to see what happens. But, getting 
Getting to the next piece and getting really into the principles of cyber weapons. There are two major things you have to always consider when looking at making, creating, or modifying a cyber weapon. The first one is, what is the psychology <coughs> of the creator or creators? You have to understand the people who made it in order to understand how to work with it, how to modify it, and how to utilize it. Because there are tons of things out there you can use, tons of source you can start with. I never recommend starting from scratch unless you're making something completely wicked and totally custom. Um, in which case, best of luck and give me a call because I'm curious now. Um, and then the second one, what is the intent, the content, and the quality of the code? That tells you a lot about who they are, what they are, what they're doing, what they're looking to do, and their overall general origin. You can do a lot with just looking at code based on something as simple as uh, a simple catchphrase and a comment that's geographically localized to a specific country. It's actually how some hackers have been caught um, based on their code base. They'll use similar phrases in their annotation or they'll leverage, for me, my bad habit is the exact same spacing of five spaces exactly. And that's actually how I almost got caught with something else. Uh, <laughs> All right, jumping into the psychology. To understand the tools that I built, you have to understand me. Um, I have a very rough toddler, like I said, adopted, 13 foster families, countless recipes, uh, severe abuse, physical and sexual in nature, um, removed from my parents, abandoned by my father, a lot of issues, uh, disabled veteran, so there's a lot of problems there, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things, active in the community and charity. So there's a lot of good things, bad things, and interesting things about a person like me, for instance. And understanding psychology helps you understand the platform, the purpose, the intent, and you can almost use it to project where they're going to go next, what they're going to do next, what they're going to try to build next. You can use it for feature scoping, what they might try to do with the tool next, and you can leverage that to not only study the tool, study the botnet, study whatever the platform they're building, but you can actually, you can actually also get ahead of them and be sitting there waiting which is actually one of the few ways to actually stop large-scale cyber weapons, is to get ahead of them and be waiting when they show up. Now, my origin story, it all started with a house fire. From there, my whole world went to hell in a handbasket. Parents got divorced, split up, taken from my parents, tossed into the state, everything just transpired, went into a snowball, got real nasty. I got out um, three specializations later at eight, I got put with my adopted family, Three years, I got adopted, left at 16, um, went military, got out of the military, did a lot of DOD work, did some civil work, did a lot of pen testing, research, and here we are today. All right, so now that you understand my psychology, keep that in the back of your mind until we get to the next part. To understand cyber weapons themselves, you have to leverage a system an independent, agnostic gradient that you can put anything and everything against. Now, there's not really a lot of information out there in terms of actual cyber weapons because they're closely guarded secrets. Most governments don't want to share them with you for obvious reasons. Anybody had any nasty experience with shadow brokers and all their goodies? Yeah, yeah, that's the reason why. <laughs> <laughs> so, with the class weapon system, I call it the class combat system, it stands for cyber land, air, sea, and space. The last thing any of us want to see right now is a cyber weapon in space, because good luck shooting at that. Um, that's just the unfortunate side effect of something moving at 24,000 plus miles per hour. All right, so with that system, cyber weapons are broken down generally into eight different segmented groups based on capabilities, content, and intent of the system itself, ranging from zero to seven. Seven being the absolute worst case scenario. If you have a class seven cyber weapon, you have a world ending death star in your possession. It is bad news. If you have a class zero weapon system, it's not a weapon system. It's pretty much a block of metal that you just bought from Starbucks. It is worthless and it has no real applicable value towards cyber engagement, cyber warfare. Um, it's pretty much just generic code with literally, I would almost borderline say in many instances it's just pseudo code. It's pretty much harmless. So jumping into the first one is concept code. Concept code is 
pretty much exactly that. It's concept code. It's, it's design. It's an ideology. It's, hey, I've got this cool idea. I've got 600 lines of comments. I've got three lines of actual functional code. And it's all like, hey, do this. Or if in blah, do blah. And literally, it's just chunks and chunks and chunks and chunks and chunks and chunks. Yes, occasionally you'll have actually functional concept code, but it's still concept code in nature. It's, hey, I've got this idea. Let me be able to transfer a file from A to B. Well, fantastic. You're moving files around. And there's nothing harmful about that. That's standard usage. So a good example of concept code is actually what happened here recently with malware tech. Anybody familiar with what happened with malware tech? All right. You do? Okay. So what happened with malware tech is he published concept code. And then he sold that concept code. Someone purchased said concept code, took the code, heavily modified it, added several other functions and capabilities to it, and took it from a class 0 system to what we estimate to be a class 4 or 5 system. More around 4. And unfortunately for malware tech, he went from being a research institute leading industry individual to a research victim facing very serious jail time and astronomically high legal fees. So again, I stress, and I cannot stress enough, you must be very careful with any code that you produce and how you distribute it, because it can very quickly take you from concept code to silver bracelets. So please be careful. The next step, you jump into defunct code. It's code, it works, but it doesn't. It's, hey, I want to throw something on your screen, and instead it tries to launch Internet Explorer. It just doesn't work. It's busted, it's broken. It's what most malware really is. Most malware is defunct code. It doesn't actually work because they didn't actually go through the process of developing it properly. It's almost always created by beginners that are currently trying to learn to make malware. It's normally always batch scripts, batch scripts, or really shitty Python. <laughs> almost every time. Or it's copy-paste code from extremely advanced concepts that just does not work because they don't have the slightest clue how to read Ruby or C, much less use it. So very, very likely to find that in the wild. Very, very likely to find that in malware that's been modified or borrowed or remote access tools that be downloaded because someone leaked the source code because I don't like Steve today, but tomorrow I'll hate him. I'll release his code, and the day after that, he beat me up in the schoolyard. So now we're friends again. That happens a lot in the community, especially on hack forums. So you'll see a lot of the funk code. Then we get into the nuisance category. It's annoying. It's not really anything that's going to hurt me. It's going to annoy me. You're going to pop up 600 windows of calculator, and it's just going to keep opening them up until it crashes my computer. Ooh. Really dangerous there, guys. It's pretty much just there to annoy you. You can kill the process, and it's dead. And you just remove it, and you fix the problem. It's no longer in your startup. They had a really cool chance to do some really fun stuff with you, and they just totally blew the opportunity. Again, generally going to be a beginner. Most experts aren't going to be using something that's like popping calc on your system with a batch script. They're definitely not going to let you know that they can pop calc on your box. Um, a lot of really good ones for web systems is defacement shells. Instead of dropping, I don't know, a JavaScript miner and making 24 bucks. <laughs> I'll probably pay for that one later. Um, <laughs> Then we get into malicious code. This is where we cross that threshold of uh, uh, a good conversation me and Jack Daniel had on Twitter a couple of weeks slash months ago was youthful indiscretions. And when people are young, especially in the cybersecurity industry, you're growing into it, you're learning, you either A, make mistakes, or B, make bad choices. Generally, it's far more B than A, um, very, very rarely do you, do, do you do something really cool by accident, um, but it does happen. Rarely, but it does happen. And uh, that's when you really cross that threshold is when you cross into category three. That's when you should start seeing jail time. And we're not looking at somebody anymore who's like, I'm going to annoy you by popping open Word documents or launching 600 web pages to get paper clicks on my YouTube channel because it's too expensive to pay for the pay-per-clicks of YouTube ads. It's, you're looking at someone that's 
intentionally infecting your system with the purpose of doing something malicious, either for personal gain, bragging rights, be it street cred, they're dicking around with uh, something like, I don't know, Dark Rat or Comet or whatever crap they've got out there these days, Cupid, Donner, and Blitzen, I don't know, they keep changing the names like every five days. It's copy-paste code. It's recycled stuff probably from something that Mob Man wrote ten years ago. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, <laughs> sadly, but true. Um, you start seeing a lot of stuff like Trojans, Droppers, Uploaders, Downloaders, your generic botnets, really simple botnets that are used mostly for DDoS attacks, your generic stuff, but again, more than enough to get you in trouble. You're starting to see an advancement in the individual's capabilities from beginner into the intermediate area uh, because these tools are more complex and not just writing some script with one liner and notepad plus plus or if you're a beginner, usually it's just notepad. Um, you're starting to see something where they're integrating systems, they're doing port forwarding, they're doing centralized command and control systems. You're not looking at a simple tool anymore, you're looking at a complex array of moderately sophisticated stuff. And that's when, again, you're starting to cross into some serious dark waters. Then we drop in to number four. This is where stuff starts to get really ugly really quick. This is when you're starting to look at 10 to 15 years. You're looking at some bad news. And this is malicious and destructive, but non-lethal. It's not something that's going to get somebody killed, but it's definitely going to do something to be very destructive to someone's life. We're starting to see stuff here. You're starting to look at Zeus botnets. You're starting to look at Orange Tide. You're starting to look at other kinds of EK kits, like what happened with Shadow Brokers, if you just pulled one of those out of it. You've got some really nasty stuff now. Now you're looking at some serious problems. You're blowing away enterprise systems. You're dumping databases and stealing credit card information. You're hacking someone's computer and hijacking the system to take over their entire IT enterprise, to turn their entire system into botnets for mining Bitcoin, which happened to a few businesses recently. You're looking at nasty, nasty stuff, but you're not killing anybody. Then you get to the class 5 weapon systems. These are killing people. You're looking at incredibly destructive systems at this point. The intent is to cause serious harm at a large scale. These systems are designed to do this. You're looking at serious malicious intent. You're looking at someone who says, I want to kill you, and I will if I can, even if it takes me a long time to do it, or if it takes me an incredibly long, indirect path to do it. This is when you're starting to see really malicious attackers. This is when you're stepping into the expert level, the high-end intermediate. You're starting to see nation states pop in. You're starting to see attacks against SCADA infrastructure, ICS infrastructure, energy, music is just, sorry, not music, um, waste management, uh, water, electrical, it's just nasty stuff. You're blowing up entire power grids. You're looking to shut down hospitals. You're looking to kill people. This is where the bad stuff really starts. And then you get into class 6 systems. Now you're not looking at something that's just attacking SCADA only. It's not just attacking waste management only. It's not just attacking electrical only. It's hitting multiple systems. I'm hitting your targeted logistics systems for your food transport and I'm wiping out your backup power systems, and I'm trying to stop your water flowing. I'm combining multiple class 5 weapon systems with the intent of destroying a lot of people's lives and wiping out entire regions. I don't want to just hurt you. I want to kill your entire country. This is when you start to see countries fighting each other, and this is when stuff gets really, really ugly, really bad. <coughs> this is the cyber equivalent of a cyber weapon of mass destruction. It is designed to destroy. There is no other intent, no other purpose. This is used as an end-all, be-all measure, and it's just bad news. Then we get to the class 7 weapon systems. This is where we have multiple class 6 weapon systems combined together. We have high-end collaborative efforts. We're looking at multiple countries cooperating with each other to wipe out other collections of multiple countries. This is a world-ending technology. 
This is the equivalent of launching thousands of nukes at the same time, all at each other, and there's just going to be nothing left, and we're going to be living in the Dark Ages, carrying around stone hammers at the end of all this. It's wiping out banking infrastructure, it's wiping out world banks, it's wiping out the SWIFT system, it's destroying the International Space Station. It's anything and everything becomes a target all at once. This is when pure hellfire breaks loose. Oops. Any questions so far? Yes? Has there been any evidence of class F? There has not been. Not yet. And hopefully there never will be. It's one of the few things that I personally hope is outlawed globally. Just like laser weapons. It's something that just shouldn't exist. Because it's an apocalypse device. Actually. So the, the highest that you probably would say would be classified like stuff next or something like that then? No, I would classify Stuxnet as a class 4 system because it's very targeted against one very specific infrastructure and it's not targeting a wide array of the energy so uh, industry. Like class five then, not really. We built one class 5 system and we're working on our second one. What, just, what class system was the Georgia attack? The Georgia attack? Yeah. I would say that would be a class 5 system. And that's because it was designed to hit a large array of systems to damage the infrastructure itself and put that country in the black. Um, the similar concerns that we currently have was there was an incident identified in the United States where several major regions had massive power outages on entire large scales. It was, I think, New York, California, and two other major regions, they got hit with huge blackouts at the exact same time, uh, which is statistically incredibly unlikely, and generally the telltale is the news media covers it instantly and then never says another word about it, which is exactly what happened, which is a great sign that somebody hit us with a class 5 system to test to see if it worked, or to send a subtle but very clear and extremely loud message, yes, we can wipe out your power systems if we choose to do so. Who? No idea. But, again, I'm pretty sure the NSA looked into that and definitely never going to publish it. Which is, again, part of the problem in the industry. No one shares information with anyone, so we have no idea. And pre preparation for systems like these is pretty much impossible. Um, next question. No question? No? Yes? What? I saw the age line. Is that referring to the age of the tool or the age of the authors? Age of the authors. So generally, when you're looking at a class 0 to a class 2 system, you're looking at a younger adolescent. And again, it gets back to understanding the psychology. If you're looking at someone that's more our age in this general peer group, we're in our 20s to 60s range. We're not there to, ha I want to pop cap in the box because I'm cool with my friends. It's, I want to steal your credit cards because that's worth $15,000 straight swipe. It's worth 400 bucks as part of my database sum. And I'm going to dump it with 600 credit cards because, you know, you all walk past the front door with an RFID reader attached to the second inch and never saw it. I'm going to bank a good 30 grand. That's the kind of idea that we have. We're not looking to, to have fun. We're looking to make money. And that's the general motive for individuals of our group. It's politically motivated, religiously motivated, <coughs> or financially motivated are the three major motivations that most people fall into. Very, very, very rarely will you fall into any other category. Pretty much ever. Um, next question. I just got one more. Sorry. Go for it. The regulation that Georgia was going to put together that basically what got moved down. So the regulation is effectively a copy pasta of the CFAA Act, which is a federal organization's uh, regulatory rule set on Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, is what CFAA stands for. And the issue with the Georgia regulations verbiage is it effectively outlaws pen testing and research against tools that you don't own or violating the agreements that you automatically copy paste agree to the second you click EULA I accept, which you have to in most softwares these days before you can even run it. Making any kind of testing, including pretty much every kind of catch the flag event or any kind of bug bounty program illegal. Um, simultaneously, a concern for us is it also makes, again, pen testing illegal, which also means that uh, 
you kind of can't be compliant at the bank. You know, the FINRA or PCI or Sarbane or pretty much every regulation that keeps your entire mainframe from being dumped into my pocket. Uh, and having pen tested banks in the past, that is an incredibly bad decision because that is a lot of money. Um, they didn't put a off the fact that it's like hard to do today. No, it's, it's a blanket rule set, and that's the problem, is they didn't try to define it or say this is allowed under these circumstances or with these exceptions or these exemptions or with these authorizations or these predetermined understandings of the community for general professional practice. There's nothing in that in terms of verbiage, to the best of our knowledge. Now, the Senate may modify that with some common sense, hopefully, and update that to where it's actually running more in line with what makes sense to the standard industry practice. and awesome thing called reality. Uh, hopefully they'll catch up. Most likely they won't, and the governor's already said they'll most likely sign it, which means we're incredibly likely to pretty much evict our entire cybersecurity industry out of Georgia, most likely in the next six months. Um, and it will impact persons like myself, Jack Daniels, and several other really awesome people in our community. So uh, that'll make our lives very difficult. So. We're constantly looking for new opportunities now, um, including me. So there are consequences to legislation. So that's why I openly tell our good friends over at the Hill, there are consequences to your decisions, and we are the ones that feel the impact, and unfortunately the economy does. So please keep that in mind if you're ever going to contact your senator or your local congressman or any of your state reps, especially if you're back. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> I'd have provided the number, but I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? Feel free. We're getting into the more fun stuff now. All right. All right, rolling into the infrastructure. Now that we understand how to understand the tools, to understand the concepts, the layouts, the designs, now we're going to start talking tech. This is where all the people that are like, you're going to build something dangerous. This is where we're going to build something dangerous. All right. So the tools that I work with and I love, I'm a very big open source proponent because it's highly available, highly effective, highly qualified to perform the job or task at hand. That is specifically because if A, you understand the mindset of the people, the psychology behind the tool, <coughs> their intent, extremely clear. Normally it's 300, 400 pages of technical documents, white papers, and a shitload of tutorials showing you exactly how to use it architectural best practices, their intent is incredibly clear. The content is pristine because there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of open source developers all contributing to the project. So the content is incredibly high quality. And because of that, open source technology is the ideal platform to go with. You start looking at closed source technology, one, you're going to pay for it. So your scalability is incredibly limited. They control the licenses, which means at any time they can restrict how many you can use. Not something you want, and I guarantee you, most people that write malware can't afford an OVL license. I guarantee you, they are insanely expensive, millions and millions and millions of dollars per software. Guarantee you, that's why it doesn't happen. Now, that being said, I leverage OpenStack. It's my system of choice, because it allows me to leverage several different types of advanced technologies collectively together, already pre-bundled, and I can modify it very quickly, I can deploy it as code, I can deploy it as a configuration template, and I can modify it very heavily, save that state, and then leverage it again and again and again. And it doesn't matter how many times I blow it up, I can rebuild it again in a matter of minutes. And that's why I like OpenStack. Start looking at my databases. I prefer two types of databases right now. I'm kind of in flux on the shift over to the cool one. Um, very heavy into MySQL. I like MySQL because it's the flavor of choice for most people, including OpenStack. Default deployments, MySQL. I'm starting to prefer Postgres, and that's simply because MySQL makes me cry at night. Uh, <laughs> I've had several MySQL databases blow up in my face, and if anybody has ever been a database admin or done data recovery, database loss is a sad panda day. I promise you. I've had to rebuild entire OpenStack environments because I lost Keystone, which also subsequently cost me all of my neutron networks because they thought it was a great idea to dump everything to one database instead of deploying cluster databases and then replicating that data uh, by default. So, huge issue. Then we've got stuff for my web stuff. I'm a big Apache fan. 
because I am heavily biased against IIS, and even more so because I have friends who work there. So I get all the cool information from that. So I love Apache. Uh, I am an Nginx user, mostly for my upstream. I like upstream the Nginx because Nginx has been proven to be superior to HA proxy in terms of performance on a head-to-head -head battle. It's about 13 to 35 percent more efficient. That's why I use Nginx with HA proxy. I use Nginx for bulk processing. I use HA proxy for ACL based routing, rerouting. So I can do auto scaling with both. And it's incredibly efficient because if you've ever worked with Nginx, it is a nightmare to configure. The downside versus the upside, where HA proxy is literally a single file and it's just beautiful. And in less than 100 lines, you have all your load balancing done. The upside to HA proxy. Then we start looking at my code management. I use GitLab because I want to own it. It's mine, and I want to control it because the last thing I want is putting all of my code into GitHub and going to jail forever. So I use GitLab, private repo, mine, limited to 100,000 projects for community version. It's far more than enough to do everything and more that you want to do and you can use ASCII docs, which are just the greatest thing since ever. If you don't know what ASCII docs are, you make me sad, and you should immediately Google them, because they are just phenomenal. If you've ever done a tutorial online, it's an ASCII doc. Don't lie to yourself. It's an ASCII doc. Use it. I love it. Now, for infrastructure, I do my own cloud. I leverage OpenStack deployed through hardware management, through IPMI, through MAS, which allows me to cluster my MAS server, which is also my DHCP server, which allows me to centrally manage all my physical hardware, centrally, one portal, all my hardware, pixie booting, all built into one, click, click, next, done, built, deployed, finished. It automatically integrates all my hardware directly into my OpenStack environment for controlling, continue, and allows me to run everything through there seamlessly with minimal effort with typing of like four commands. It's permanently configured and ready to run. And yes, you can automate that with Bash. You can even have it get the information for you, and with landscape, it does do it for you, but that's the new version. So, um, if you're a corporate enterprise, leverage landscape because, I mean, you have the money. If you're your own lab, I don't use it. Um, looking at the external infrastructure, when you want to start looking at destructive superscale, you're looking at somebody else's gear, because I promise you, Amazon has more servers in the room of the size that you are sitting in than you probably possess in your entire collective lifetime. They have buku amounts of servers beyond words. And it is sitting there, and with a single stroke of a single command, you can add more gear instantly. As much as you want. And they will not tell you no. I promise you, that credit card will float that balance. And depending on what server you use, it won't even bill you until you start using it. And if you're looking at it from a criminal perspective, that card is probably stolen. So, <laughs> more than likely, not your problem either way. Now, that being said, I also leverage other things like customized code, Python, PowerShell, Bash. If I want to laterally move between OpenStack and Hyper-V because I'm bouncing between Azure and my own OpenStack flavor and Amazon because I'm constantly moving things around from different vendors to make it incredibly difficult for them to detect what I'm doing and to respond efficiently because I'm constantly moving my data sets and domains. And the one thing that huge companies will never do is collaborate. So you're totally fine there. They hate each other and are constantly looking for ways to get a one of edge, even if it's watching the other one burn and just completely industry irresponsible practices. I promise you, they will watch each other burn just to make a profit. They do it every time. So, a lot of tech, a lot of code, a lot of customized code, um, a lot easier than you might think. Understanding the principles is what's important. You have to grasp the principles before you move on to building stuff, <coughs> simply because the principles are critical. If you get the principles, you'll understand where you're going and why you're trying to get there and why it's beneficial, which are listed here. Resource management and monitoring. I need to know what gear I've got, what VMs I've got, what systems I've got. Am I at 12%? Am I at 46%? Am I at 46% plus two scale per second? How fast will I burn up to 80 where I need to build another one, another one, another one? 
Hey, what happened to this entire stack? Why did the whole thing drop down to 2% utilization? I was at 80, now I'm at 2. What happened? All right, laterally move. Someone busted me. I got to ship now. You can auto scale everything, auto migrate everything, but you have to understand resource management. Do that. Rapid up scale, rapid down scale. Again, if I'm burning servers and they're not doing what I want them to do because they finished a task, I'm doing an MAP scan across an entire country. Yes, you can scan an entire country in less than two minutes. I promise you, it works. You just have to have the gear and the bandwidth. That is all you need. And if you've got a massive botnet, you got everything you need. You just have to manage the task. And if you've never looked into computer clustering, you've been out of here for about a decade now? Beowulf clusters, they're pretty much a commodity. I'm sure at least five people in this building have a Beowulf cluster sitting in their car or in their bag. Um, it's pretty impressive tech. I like it. So you manage those tasks centrally. That allows you to manage all the issues that you're going to run into when I say, okay, I need to scan a country. How do I deal with this task? That's when you do reverse auto summarization. So I want to take that into one large network that's a slash 8. I want to chop it into a crazy amount of slash 24s so that a shitload of systems can all start scanning it simultaneously, but each hitting their own unique network and essentially dumping that information response back into centralized cluster databases where Postgres and MySQL come into play. Now you're starting to see where the systems come back into play and they auto integrate and they auto upscale, downscale based on performance needs and performance demand or lack thereof, which is also very important. Recycling your resources when you have limited resources incredibly important to move things faster and faster and more efficiently. Then you start getting to updating, scaling, transferring, and the general services. What happens if I'm on Amazon and I'm using badnews.awesome.com and all of a sudden Amazon drops this blacklist moratorium on the domain? Well, now all my systems that are coming from that domain are now blacklisted. They're all automatically purged. Well, if I'm using five different systems to do five different things, and one of them gets purged, that task just dropped off the map. I need to manage my tasks. That needs to continue. So I need to load balance the domains themselves that I'm leveraging. So I have multiple domains conducting the same tasks, but split up into different pieces so it's unique. So say, for instance, I'm, I'm taking uh, slash 24, and I chop it into four more networks. And I've got domain 1, 2, 3, and 4, each taking one of those four pieces. And then domain 4 drops off. I can have a fifth domain auto scale with a generic AI and automatically generate me hundreds of thousands of domains that I can automatically build, and then all of a sudden, I've got another domain coming up. Fifth domain, sixth domain, seventh domain, eighth domain. And it keeps picking them up, Amazon keeps dropping them, I keep scanning them, and every six seconds, they catch me another one, they catch another one. But every six seconds, I've scanned six more IPs, eight more IPs, 12 more IPs. I'm still getting my task done. Is it annoying me? Absolutely, but it's annoying them far more. I promise you, they will eventually give up. Eventually. Some of them are stubborn. Now, why that's important is if you have to understand the principles to understand and identify the key features. Your critical points of failure. This is where your system will make or break. It's got to work or it's going to die. Period. And those are simple features. Virtualization. If I can't virtualize, I can't auto-migrate. I can't live-migrate. If it's a physical box, it's going to take longer. It's going to take more time. It's going to have a lot more information in it because of the physical box. If it's a virtual instance, good luck finding it. And you got to parse through 3,000 VMs to get to it. It's coming from an IP, yeah, but you put 300 web pages on that one IP. Good luck finding the right one. It's going to take you some time. You've got to take your packets. You've got to take your logs. And that is where I will get those 6 seconds, those 8 seconds, those 10 IPs, those 30 IPs, those 50 IPs. And I'll get more and more and more and more as you continue to battle over shared space. Now, configuration and code deployment. You have to effectively, efficiently, and intelligently manage your code and your configurations. They need to make sense. The naming convention needs to make sense. When you're sitting down and you're knocking out 8,000 lines of code, it needs to make sense to you. It needs to be some kind of processing a naming convention that says, okay, well, it's going to come from this folder specifically because this folder is responsible for X task or X action. And then in that folder is a subfolder based on another function. That function is specific to the task I'm trying to achieve. It's got to be in there. 
I've got eight scripts. I've got to call the one. Well, the function, I know what I want it to do. So it's going to be whatever I named it for that function. What I normally do is literally name it for what it does. So it moves a file. I'm going to grab the file under operating system, system function, moves a file. And that's what I'm going to put in my code. Because moves a file.ps1 is going to move me a file. Now all I have to do is go into moves me a file and have a predetermined variable or a unique variable that's going to grab whatever I feed to it, which will be the file, and move it from A to B, which B will be predetermined. So if A is determined and B is predetermined and the variable is the file, all I have to do is call the capability and it will immediately conduct a task for me, filling in that requirement. That's why that's important. Then we get into things like global storage with triplicated data. Again, why I like OpenStack. Because OpenStack likes Ceph. Ceph triplicates my data for me automatically and then makes data automatically live with one copy type. And then in the instant that data dies or becomes corrupted or unreadable, it goes after the second. And if that one's unreadable, it goes after the third. You have to kill enough data systems across enough platforms for me to exist to a point where <coughs> I've lost so many drives or so many virtual disks that I can no longer run. But what happens if I put one in my private cloud, one in Amazon, one in Google, and one in Microsoft? You have to kill two sets at least just to bring me to a point of failure, killing three to actually achieve it. But you have to do that across four major competitors who all hate each other and do not communicate on any form of automated basis. Which means at a worst case scenario, you have to call your buddy at Google who has to call his buddy over at Amazon, and you all three have to jump on a conference call, and you have to go in and destroy my data system, at which case I'm already building another one, and another one, and another one. But all of your processes are going to execute at different time frames, which because of auto-scaling, the second you kill my set system, I'm simply adding more set nodes. And so it doesn't matter if you wipe them out. You have to kill all four of them across the board, and on that case, one of them is mine. So good luck breaking into my system to kill my storage to do that. So very, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve. Then it comes down to the monitoring. You want to constantly keep an eye on the resources manually. It's the only manual process you will experience in tools to this capacity is watching your resource utilization. Because you have no idea when something really awesome or really horrible will happen. And that's when you want to interject things manually. Dump out manual code, start manual commands, start manual processes to either recover or all of a sudden you have an alert pop up. Hey, foreign access to the system from NSA.gov might be time to blow the box away and cover your tracks. I would want to know that ahead of time and then definitely have manual processes to destroy irreparably and irrecoverably all of that data. Because jail time is big. Then we get into important features. For OpenStack, it's Nova Evacuate. That's how your systems are going to dump the VM instances and move to other places. Nova Cloud Controller is what controls that capability. It moves it for you. But the trigger for that is a rabbit in queue message for, I do believe, XML RPC message specifically sent as a Nova Evacuate request in the rabbit in queue service in the rabbit in queue database, which is where that message will actually physically reside. Now, that's when you see that pop up, that's when you know, hey, my VMs are leaving because my box has died or stopped communicating. That means somebody's looking at the box in most instances, or they've blocked the box, or quarantined the box, or killed the box, and it's no longer there, and your cloud controller is responding by pulling it from your step system, usually, if it's still available, and relocating it to another system that you control. Again, recovering from your loss. Automated. Next thing is move-vm. That is the Microsoft way. They don't have Nova Evacuate. Unless you build OpenStack on Microsoft, which is taking Hypervisor and building OpenStack instances inside a Hypervisor. So you're virtualized in a virtualized instance. Very, very messy. Very, very quickly gets out of hand. Don't recommend it. Just use move-vm and leverage the fact that PowerShell Core exists, which is awesome, by the way. If you don't know much about PowerShell Core, I advise installing it just so you can play with it because it's fabulous. And then Rabbit, which we already really covered. 
You want to know what's going on in your messaging system because you want to know what's going on inside your open stack. So you want to see this stuff to respond to it effectively and efficiently. That's very important. And in order to do that, you got to have a centralized communication system. Rabbit's your guy. You could use other messaging systems like Zero and Q. I like Rabbit. Teach them. And then database synchronization. Your data needs to be redundant because people will come after you. Guarantee it. Amazon will shut you down. They have some very <laughs> talented people there. And they will constantly be knocking your systems. You've got to constantly be rebuilding them. In order to do that, you need your data to be uncorrupted. In order for that, you need redundant data systems, specifically synchronized databases, because your networks will work, specifically because Neutron works. And Neutron stores all of your networks in the database. Synchronized database, save the world. Route summarization. You can auto-scale your networks in the instance that systems go down with an incremental instancing. So say, for instance, I built 100 systems. I'm going to build 10.0.0 to 10.0.99 instantly. And then I'm going to build route summarizations into my deployed PF sense boxes for routing. And in the instance you blow up an entire network, you blew up all of 10.0.5. It's gone. I'm going to immediately spin up 10.0.100. And I now have another network. And because I'm auto-scaling with route summarization, auto-scaling, my routing will be incredibly efficient because I'm scaling to instances of four. I'm summarizing on instances of four, leveraging slash 24s. So I'm constantly combining those into networks. And I'm summarizing on slash 26s. I do believe it's 26, right? Four? My network is all messed up today. Too much tequila. <laughs> but yeah, that's how you handle it. YAML files are your magic bean sauce. YAML files allow you to build everything out that you want it to be with one file. And it tells the system to build you into X. Permissions of X, accesses of X, files of X, configurations of Y, extra commands of blah, 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 blah. All in one text file that it can pull from your Git system and then immediately build the entire instance. Very, very important. Very, very important. They're called heat templates. Install it, use it, love it. And the last piece, very important, load balancing. You need to constantly be shifting your domains. The great thing about EDNS and load balancing is that with one change, I can drastically change my routing process. If I'm running through a country that's on to me, Chinese are hunting me down because they are mad, mad, mad that I'm blowing away their banking sector and they catch one of my systems. I can reroute all of my traffic through my PFSense firewalls through DDNS by going in, logging into the portal, and changing five IPs. I can leverage multiple DDNS services, so in the instance they break into that DDNS service to find out who I am, or where I am, or what I'm routing through, I can switch to my other DDNS services and avoid that. Very, very important. Questions? Any questions? Have you have you thought about, uh, or, or are you going to talk about uh, any Docker type stuff? We're currently working on Docker stuff right now um, because with Kubernetes. Yeah, Kubernetes is one of the yeah. like the primary orchestration tools for Docker. I mean, just so some of, some of what you're talking about from the bare metal standpoint, right? But then you have when you start scaling up to that application, right? Then you know automating that. Yeah, you, you can do that with LXC with uh, Magnum and OpenStack for people who want to use containers. And I recommend containers with OpenStack for LXC because LXC is a systems grade container. When Kubernetes and Docker come into play, Docker is a service-based container. Different purposes for application. You're going to have far more issues, like with BSD, for instance. You can't use Docker for BSD. It's not compatible. But with LXC, you can. And that's a key difference. I can leverage PFSense for my firewall, which again is free. Very important that I have that. Um, next question. No? Next. All right. So, when we start playing hardball, I'm going to wipe people out. I've built a class 5 weapon system. I want to nuke Australia because they outlaw kangaroos and I hate them now. Now we start to play with a grid. I want to build up, I'm going to rapidly deploy my entire infrastructure globally. I'm going to build out a mass box that's building mass boxes across the globe. I don't want to hit you from one place and you'd be, hey, they're in the U.S. I want to hit you from 30 countries at once. You're not going to have a clue where I'm coming from. You're just going to know I'm beating the ever-living shit out of you 
And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. This is also how you beat blue teams into oblivion. Just in case you're a pen tester, you can horrify them with these techniques with very minimal costs, especially if you have buddies in other countries. Then we start looking at the networking. It very quickly becomes into an insanity system. Do not try to memorize this. Let auto scaling, auto summarization do it for you. This is why. Can you imagine having thousands of networks all routing and you constantly trying to upgrade and update documentation? It's not feasible. You're not that good at Visio, and good luck trying to automate it. I've tried and failed, and I can make damn near anything automate. Visio, not friendly for automations. Then your traffic flow. Firewall, load balancer, dynamic, BDR, you're looking at PFSense or BSD router, both. You're looking at core routers. I use BIOS. I like Open vSwitch a lot for my distributed stuff, especially for my SDN. I prefer L2, L3 systems like Open Daylight, Open vSwitch. I want to be able to control my routers and my switching incredibly intimately, automated, and on a software basis so I can rapidly change ideas, concepts, principles with minimal effort for maximum optimization efforts. Then you start getting the system flow. System flow is very straightforward. You configure your operating systems, you configure your code base, you've got all that stuff compiled together, you've got to dump it dumped into a GitLab. Now we start banging on stuff. All right, I want to go after somebody because Tuesday and Japan and they outlaw ramen. I'm coming for you, you've made me mad, I want my ramen, you better add my Naruto Uzumaki roll back in there and give me my discount or it's game on. I'm rolling my config out. I've got my code deployment, my clusters are now building, I'm building clusters across entire continents, and I'm about to knock stuff over, I'm building my failover sites up, and then auto-scaling gets <coughs> sent because tasks have been issued, and then we've got the attack process, reverse summarization, I kick out an in-map scan against all of Japan, I'm coming for everybody, because I am mad, and it's just a bad day, I'm hitting a class 8 network, and I'm coming for everyone on the internet in Japan. Don't care, I'm coming for you, it's a bad day for you. I'm reversing that, splitting into hundreds of tasks, sending it across all these systems that are scaled and clustered across the globe. They're all coming together, they've got their tasks, the systems say, hey, I need X number of resources based on this task request because I'm constantly hitting 80, 80, 80, 80, add VM, add VM, add VM, add VM, YAML, 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 all the code again and again and again and again. Configurations, they're all swarming in, they are ready to beat the shit out of you. Task gets retrieved. System starts getting tracked. Parameterization has been set. My nmap scan commands have been set inside the code base. The configuration files are updated for that. Now it's time to start tracking the task because they are scanning you, ready to hit you with auto exploit, and it's going to be a bad, bad day because that whole process just got automated, and then it starts auto scaling. Japan starts, oh god, we're getting beat down, beat down, beat down. All right, start blocking, start blocking, start blocking because we're blue team and highly predictable. And then you just start beating them from five different corners and they're just like, oh, you're migrating and they don't have any idea. You finish, they bring ramen back because they'd rather be online than not have ramen. And that's how you get your ramen back. And that is how and why all the things and self-healing side away. Any questions? Very exciting topic. Like I said, it goes very quickly from understand the principles, understand the psychology, understand the scaling, understand the principles, foundations, and technology, and then rapidly deploy, and you can very clearly and predictably understand why. At the same time, you can also see why it would be very, very difficult to defend against systems like that because it's very difficult to find the source if they're spreading all over the place initially from a single centralized point, but you have no guarantee that single, that single centralized point is your point of, div, uh, of origin, and at the same time, that's assuming that you can track it down, assuming you have jurisdiction, and assuming I didn't set that laptop on fire shortly after building out the entire environment, which, seeing as in botnets and bots are like a quarter of a system, grandma's laptop just became the arbiter of destruction for Japan because of ramen. So any questions? So if anything happens to uh, Georgia's legislation, do you want to have an idea who did? <laughs> <laughs> I can either confirm or deny. 
Unless they have diplomatic status, in which case you will surely know. No, no, if they pass the law, it's just what me and Jack have talked about, and what other guys have talked about with us, it's like, if they're going to pass the regulations, we're going to have to eat it. But at the same time, they're going to have to eat it, because ultimately, guys like me, we love building what we built, because it's our passion, it's our dreams, it's our excitement, our energy, our reason for getting up tomorrow. Whether I build that for the U.S. government or the Russian government, that comes down to, will I go to jail if I'm working with you? Most definitely. Will I go to jail if I'm working with you? As long as I keep working, probably not. And so those are the lesser of two evils that the government is very quickly pushing engineers and researchers like us to. They're pushing us to the brink of where we're leaving the country. And one of my projects, Lucius, which is a malware development framework, I have already exported out of the country to Canada because they started arresting people for concept code, even in the fact that you built in backdoors of the technology, even in the fact that the concept code was de-weaponized or non-weaponized in nature. Uh, Aeon hack being a perfect example. Remote access tool was watching people leverage it for uh, malicious usage. He built in backdoors into his software and kill switches. He went to jail anyways. That's the reality in the world that we live in. And those are the issues that we as researchers have to respond to. And those are the problems. And that's the reason why a lot of us are leaving. Not just the state, sometimes the country. Um, so it's highly anticipated within the next one to three years that the U.S. will most likely experience a severe brain drain of high-end cybersecurity talent for which they will never recover. Um, and seeing as in the new battle zone is based directly in cyber, it's incredibly likely that that will be the ultimate downfall for the U.S. military, is a lack of cyber capabilities directly due to legislation issues that forces out of the country, effectively outlawing nuclear research for the equivalent of kicking Einstein out for being a nuclear research and businesses. Um, but yeah, that's what's happening to us on a regular basis. So, yeah, and they're killing our collaborative efforts. So, that sucks too. Yeah, I know. I talked to him. <laughs> you gotta scope them out, man. It's free awesome right there. <laughs> Any questions? Any other questions? Please feel free. More than happy to give you anything but source code. <laughs> that was caught on tape, right? Okay, good. <laughs> no questions? Really? Wow. These guys are like, I'm sorry, I just want to go drink beer. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to come talk to me, advanced topics, uh, efforts, research you're currently doing, feel free. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and it's definitely been a pleasure being here at B-Side Stampa. Thank you.